Um, as you see the uh, program, uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, folks from uh, around the uh, state uh, at the University of California. We work in uh, collaborative uh, teams. So the first speaker uh, today is uh, uh, Professor uh, Zalem. And uh, uh, I don't think he needs uh, any further in introduction uh, on this topic. So I'll just uh, turn it over to him and uh, let him take it away. Well, my first question is, do I have to keep my mask on or not? And I guess not, so that's, that's great. Um, well, my name is Frank Zalem. I'm a professor of entomology here at UC Davis. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about our experiences with uh, red blotch. The, uh, when we first started working on, on this problem was about 2013. And um, my role was to try to determine if there was a vector for uh, red blotch disease. At that point, we weren't sure uh, that red blotch was spreading, or, or a lot of the people um, that had been working on red blotch were, wasn't sure. However, we started seeing um, certain patterns of, uh, that would indicate a spread of, uh, of red blotch. We also had uh, some experience looking at specific vineyards where we were able to um, map the vineyards and look from year to year and see that the number of uh, red blotch uh, infested vines were increasing. So um, this is a pretty good example of a vineyard that we were looking at at that time. Um, and this is the kind of uh, pattern that you see. If it, at a lot of the red blotch that, well probably the majority of red blotch infested vineyards were infested prior to us knowing uh, that there was a virus that was responsible for red blotch. So it was uh, uh, planted uh, in the entire vineyard used in the planting stock. But we did see a lot of instances like this where you'd see uh, a, uh, in this case there was an infested uh, vineyard next to it. Um, we would see a lot of uh, infested vines nearby that vineyard, so you'd see the pattern like this. And then you would see individual hits that were new and random infections uh, farther beyond the, uh, uh, that initial point of infec infection. So we tried to identify vineyards where we saw this sort of a pattern or where we could confirm that uh, spread was occurring. We would be collecting then uh, flow and feeding hemiptera for the infected areas of the vineyard. Uh, we would do, use PCR to test uh, the insects for the presence of red blotch virus in them. Um, and then we would identify those insect species that had high uh, proportions of insects uh, in the bodies. And more recently, we're using salivary glands as an indicator. I'll explain about that in a few minutes. And then we had to identify the insect species. The, uh, so in, in just 2014 and 2015 alone, we did about uh, 225 uh, transmission studies uh, using insects that we collected from a lot of these study sites where we believed that spread was occurring. Um, we, had to, we tried to establish insect colonies, and this ended up uh, being exceedingly difficult because a lot of these insects were difficult to even identify and a lot of them had no information in the literature about their uh, biologies or feeding habits. And so uh, in most cases, it was almost impossible or impossible for us to really um, be able to start colonies. But in some cases, we were able to. Um, we would then allow those insects that we collected to feed on uh, uh, grape vi vi uh, red blotch uh, virus infected grapevines. And then we would take those insects after feeding and put them on negative uh, uh, grapevines. And then we had to wait. And we didn't really know how long it would take for the uh, virus to be expressed in the plant. And to be honest, we still don't really know exactly. And so we would just test those uh, plants periodically then for the presence of the virus. At that point, uh, one paper came out of Washington State University that indicated that um, erythroneuro zigzag, which is the Virginia creeper leafhopper, might be a vector of uh, red blotch. Um, but we were noting that we didn't find uh, Virginia creeper leafhopper at a lot of the sites where uh, 
the red blotch virus was present. Um, we also um, uh, were a little concerned because uh, most Gemini viruses are phloem limited and uh, Virginia creeper leaf hopper feeds on the uh, mesophyll. So it was kind of unlikely that it would actually be a vector. Um, we, we did transmission work in our lab and, and there were a number of other labs that did this too. Um, uh, Kent Dane will be talking a little bit earlier. Their lab had similar experiences where we would do uh, transmission studies uh, to try to see if we could uh, find red blotch infected uh, transmission occurring. Um, and you could see here, uh, we did this with Virginia creeper leaf hopper. We also did it with um, uh, the uh, variable uh, uh, grape leaf hopper and also the uh, 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 Western grape leaf hopper, which are more common in our vineyards than uh, Virginia creeper leaf hopper, but we had no transmission with any of those species. Um, these are just some indications of how else we uh, would uh, determine a vector species. Um, we can do this by looking at the number of positives that occurred, and we had very few insects where we found them in the bodies. Uh, and. We also look at the CT tests, low CT tests that's similar to what we see in a vine would indicate that um, uh, the, uh, there was a higher vir virus concentration in the insect and we just didn't see that with Virginia creeper leafhopper. Um, then by the end of 2015, we had uh, five uh, insects that we considered possible candidates because they had uh, relatively high percentage of uh, uh, gra grape red blotch virus present when we would look at the bodies of the insects. They also had relatively high or relatively low CT values, which would indicate a, a higher virus load, and all of them were phloem feeders. Um, in early 2016, we started to get some indication that the tree hopper we were studying had uh, uh, positive transmission. In this case, in three of 15 uh, uh, grape vines, we were able to find uh, 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 grape, rot, uh, grape red blotch virus infection. Um, we followed this a little longer and we found that uh, after several more months, we were able to get a higher number of vines uh, infected. And so um, we believe that uh, this tree hopper was the uh, potential vector of, of uh, grape red blotch virus. This was the three-cornered alfalfa hopper. Uh, the scientific name is Spacistolus festinus, and um, our lab published a paper, uh, uh, senior authored by Brian Botter, who was a postdoc in our lab at that particular time. A little of the biology of three-cornered alfalfa hopper the adults are about uh, a, a quarter of an inch long. Uh, the eggs are very small and they're inserted into uh, woody uh, host plant stems. Uh, the nymphs are very interesting looking. They're, they're described as wedge shaped and they have these spines on the backs. And they're very difficult to see. You, if you really look for them in, in uh, particularly legume ground covers, uh, you may see them and uh, they'll be pretty distinctive uh, in terms of their morph morphology with those spines. The, uh, again, the eggs are laid on the shoots of the host plants. Uh, the immatures can complete their development on herbaceous hosts and they prefer legumes. Um, there's anywhere from two to four generations of three-corner alfalfa hopper a year in California. Um, in our experience, there's usually uh, three in vineyards. Um, we still need to confirm that on a wider basis. Um, they overwinter as eggs in the plant tissue, uh, but more commonly they uh, overwinter as adults uh, that are protected by ground cover. Um, the type of uh, 
damage that they cause to the grapevines is what we can what we call girdling, and this is where they feed on the the either the petioles or the shoots, the green shoots, and we see a little ring around those shoots. And on the photo here, you can see a. Uh, this is a little tricky one to use, uh, but there's a uh, girdle on a uh, green shoot. These are petiole girdles, and when they get a little bit older, these are what they look like on the uh, leaf petioles. The, uh, so then we embarked on trying to determine more about their biology and, and in terms of how we might be able to manage the insect better around vineyards. So we looked at uh, in detail at the biology and around, and around the vineyards. We looked at the seasonal phenology of the vector. We uh, tried to determine th what the role is of ground cover as a host for the vector. Um, uh, and uh, also uh, if the ground cover might be infected by uh, red blotch virus, which it isn't. The only uh, plants that we found red blotch virus in are either uh, cultivated grapevines or um, uh, wild vines. Um, and then we also wanted to know some other details like will the nymphs transmit the virus and we still haven't been able to do that. Um, and there's a lot of other questions then that still remain about the, the uh, tree hopper that we're studying. This was work that was done by Cindy Preto who was a graduate student in our uh, lab at the time. And it's by far the most detailed study of uh, uh, three-cornered alfalfa hopper probably in California and certainly on grapevines. And uh, uh, she'll be talking a lot more about this later today, so I don't want to uh, go through this in any detail right now. The other thing we were interested in is, well, at what time of the year do we see these girdles occur on the grapevines? Because we know that uh, they're really, the tree hopper is not present on the uh, grapevines themselves until later in the year, but the feeding on the grapevines, the skirtling would be an indicator of when they start moving to the grapevines. And so this was a study done by another graduate student in our lab, Michael Bollinger. And um, Michael, uh, in Michael's study, this was a commercial vineyard. It isn't the Oakville Field Station, but it's very nearby the Oakville Field Station. Uh, we also conducted this study at a couple of other sites. Um, we found that the uh, time of the first girdles is sometime in May to early June. Um, and so that would be the time when we're most concerned about transmission potentially occurring. We don't know if transmission occurs at that time or not but at least we know that the tree hoppers feed on the grapevines at that particular time. Where we see most of the girdles occur um, is later, um, and this is pretty much synchronized with when the ground cover that they're feeding on in the vineyards start to decline. And when that ground cover starts to senesce, then we, they start moving up onto the grapevines themselves and we see more uh, girdling. Uh, the numbers here are the number of girdles per vine. Um, and we, what we would do in the study is we would take the, we would remove the girdles as we find them all through the year. And so this is actually the number of girdles that are occurring each, oops. Well, that didn't help. Let me go back really quick. Uh, this is the number of girdles then that uh, occur during that previous two-week period and uh, per vine, and this was 30 vines that were sampled each in each vineyard during the week, uh, during the, each visit. And, and the light bars are the number of uh, girdles that we found on the petioles and the darker bars the number on the stems. So you see maybe we see a few more on the petioles than we see on the stems, but we, or on the shoots, but we see them uh, at both sites. Um, the other thing that was important is we know that they're uh, on the ground cover. So do they have particular ground covers that are good feeding hosts or reproductive hosts? Um, uh, reproductive hosts would be those on which the tree hopper can complete its life cycle. And uh, 
feeding hosts would be ones that they just uh, uh, clearly feed on on the plan. This again was a paper that was produced by uh, Cindy as part of her dissertation research, and I'm not going to go into that in a lot of detail either because I don't know how much she may cover today or, or not. Um, but basically, uh, we found that most legumes are feeding in reproductive hosts, and there's a very few exceptions where they're not, and some of these in include dandelion, common ground sill, field bindweed, and uh, blando brome, uh, where we, they, can all, they both feed and reproduce, but there's a number of other hosts that they can feed on in the uh, vineyard as well. Um, are grapevines reproductive hosts for spacistolus? Well, like other tree hoppers, tree, I guess the common name uh, has a lot to do to explaining the bi biology, and tree hoppers basically feed on trees or woody plants a lot. And uh, the tree hoppers oviposit on woody hosts. Um, in a lot of cases, the tree hoppers can't complete their life cycle on these woody hosts, so they have to leave and uh, feed on uh, other hosts, and typically these other hosts are legumes uh, that are in the vicinity of the, where the trees are, so they may fall down the trees or onto the hosts. And then they uh, complete their life cycle on those alternate hosts, uh, and then uh, they can move as adults back onto a ovipositional host. And the, uh, this is the case with uh, suspicious Spacistilus festinus as well. However, uh, it can also complete its life cycle on, on these uh, legume hosts. The, uh, uh, then that information went into the development of a uh, decision support model for when uh, we could take uh, cultural management actions against uh, to try to limit the, uh, the uh, populations in the field. And again, this is something that I, is going to be the primary topic of Cindy's talk later today. Um, beyond that, we were interested in studying the actual transmission of grape red blotch virus. Things like what factors affect their success in transmission? Um, are there certain uh, biotypes that might be poor, uh, more competent vectors? Um, and as we're getting farther and farther into this, we're starting to determine that there are a lot of things we don't know about transmission because the transmission studies that we've done have been notoriously inconsistent. Um, sometimes we get no transmission at all. Sometimes we get very poor transmission. Um, and so what are the factors involved in, in transmission? And we're still trying to determine some of that. We also wonder if there's other tree hopper species or even other hemipteran vectors that might be involved in in transmission, and I, there's a lot of un, outgoing studies by us and other labs in looking at that. Um, in 2021, uh, Mark Fuchs' lab from Cornell came out with what I think is a very important finding in terms of transmission, and that was that the uh, transmission of the uh, 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 virus is circulative and not propagative in the insect. In, and so it confirmed that Spacistus festinus was a vector of uh, three-cornered alfalfa hopper. Um, and also, in addition to being circulative in the insect, the acquisition period, they determined, was more than 10 days. And a lot of our studies have been done in far less time than that. We've been looking at anywhere from 48 to uh, 96 or a little bit more hours of acquisition, and we've also been looking at the inoculation periods. Um, and in total, virtually all of our studies have been done with less than uh, 10 days of, uh, and so having a la lengthy uh, latent periods probably inhibited a lot of the work that we've been doing with three-cornered alfalfa hopper as well as uh, other potential vectors for the, so anyway, that was a really important uh, finding. Um, so we have been starting several years ago to look at salivary glands because we felt like it was important that uh, if the insect was going to transmit the virus, that it would have to be present in their salivary glands so they could inject it in the inject the virus in the uh, plant. 
Um, it's very difficult to dissect, as you might imagine, uh, salivary glands from a, a small insect. And, and we were doing this, we do this routinely from a lot of different uh, uh, vector species or potential vector species that we're studying. Um, just to give you an idea of size, this is the uh, salivary glands within the head of the insect. This is the actual salivary glands. And this little scale is a micrometer scale in the microscope. So it's really, these are really tiny. Um, you have to remove them and you have to be very careful not to contaminate anything because, uh, so we don't pick up the red blotch virus um, due to some sort of contamination. So this is all done on a, under a very sterile process. Um, and so uh, we use this then to try to, to determine, again, um, methodology that we're using is it uh, useful? And then also, uh, when we look at other potential vectors, are they, uh, is there a higher probability of them being a vector than just using their whole bodies as an indicator of uh, presence of the virus? And to give you a little example on this, because now we're also, one of the things we're starting to look at is if there's other biotypes of uh, three-cornered alfalfa hopper that might be vectors. Um, so this is just some examples of studies that we did in 2020, uh, where we collected three-cornered alfalfa hopper from different hosts and from uh, uh, different uh, counties. We looked at, uh, some of them we, we just examined the uh, insect, the presence of the virus in the insect from, field, from the field. In other cases, we let them feed on uh, infected grapevines in the greenhouse before we looked at their presence in the uh, uh, insect. And these are uh, just some examples of all the, the studies that we looked at in, in 2020. Um, we had uh, about 19% where, where we were able to show grape volume red blotch virus in the salivary glands of the insects. Um, as opposed to when we used the whole bodies, there was about 28% present. Um, and, uh, but you can also see from this, uh, in a lot of cases, we would see very high levels of positives in the salivary glands from certain areas or certain vineyards. Um, when we collected them from other areas, uh, we uh, had basically very little uh, virus present in the salivary glands, even when we let them feed on uh, grapevines. So um, we began sequencing a lot of these specialists that we were collecting from different sites. Um, we are just at the beginning of doing a lot of this work right now, but we did find a population from a vineyard where we have documented spread for the last three or four years uh, in which their uh, CO1 gene substantially differs from those commonly found elsewhere. For example, on the, the three-corn alfalfa hopper from alfalfa that we collected here at Davis. And, uh, but when we look at the insects themselves, the populations are morphologically indistinguishable. So we can't tell them from one another until we squash up the insect and look at their genetics. And that doesn't help us with transmission studies. So uh, it, it's a complicating factor and it's something we're trying to work through now. Um, but we're also looking at uh, 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 to try to get some of these species then and look at morphological differences and see if we can distinguish some sort of differences in that way. Are there other tree hopper species that could be vectors? Uh, and I would say possibly there are. Um, there's an interesting paper that was put out uh, uh, in 2003 that said candidate vectors of plant viruses may be suggested through phylogenetic analyses of known virus vector relationships if the virus of interest is closely related to another well-characterized virus. That means if you're looking at something like Gemini viruses um, and you can look at the similarity of different Gemini viruses, those are the most similar um, likely have uh, vectors that are uh, also similarly related. And that actually makes quite a bit of uh, sense evolutionarily. 
So we looked at a phylogenetic tree of all of the, uh, uh, of, of 23 of the different Gemini viruses where there are, are genetic sequences that were found. They broke out into groups that were transmitted by leafhoppers. So all these are very closely related. Uh, 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 the ones that are next to each other are closely related viruses. Uh, these are all ones that were leafhopper transmitted. These are ones that are membracid transmitted or tree hoppers. And these are ones that are whitefly transmitted. And what's interesting about this is that uh, prior to identification of grapevine red blotch virus, uh, there was only one the, uh, species that was also determined to be uh, tree hopper uh, transmitted, and that was tomato uh, pseudo curly top virus. And it turns out that these are that's the closest related uh, virus to grape red blotch virus. So you would expect that uh, it's other you know, tree hoppers beside at least another insect within a tree hopper group could potentially be a vector. Um, the uh, also in 2021 there was a study then that helped support that hypothesis um, done by a research group in British Columbia. Um, they did this, however, with a uh, artificial transmission system. And the artificial transmission system, oh darn it, sorry about that. Hitting the wrong button here. But that system involves uh, letting the vectors that they collected feed on, on uh, infected vines in the lab or in the greenhouse. Then they would remove them, put them into a little vial with a uh, sucrose uh, tab on the top of the vial that was covered um, uh, with a membrane, and then the insect would feed on that membrane, and they would look at the uh, the sucrose then that was left after the feeding of the insect to see if they could detect the virus in it. And their idea was if they could, if the insect was feeding on that after they fed it on a grape red blotch infected vine, that it, that the virus would also be present in the sucrose. And so it's kind of a, it is an artificial method of looking at transmission, but it was an interesting uh, study and they published that in uh, uh, 2021. So this was one of the tables from that particular study. And here they're looking at uh, tree hoppers from vineyards, infected vineyards in British Columbia, leaf hoppers, uh, a sharpshooter, a cercopid, and an aphid. And they, uh, these were all the different species they looked at. And these were where they would find which species they found the transmission to occur in. And I'm going to call this out a little bit uh, closer because the only ones that they found, the only species that they found transmission occurring in were in uh, uh, two dictocephalus species. And these are tree hoppers. And uh, you know, not super high levels of transmission, but at least transmissions were transmission was occurring. Um, and what was interesting about this also is that Stichocephala and Spacicillus are members of the same tribe, which is a taxonomic grouping in uh, 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 tree hoppers. So they're relatively closely related. Um, and all these other insects that they looked at, including 32 different leafhopper species, did not transmit the virus. So that's kind of confirmation that uh, there's some fidelity, potentially, with the species uh, that can transmit uh, grape red, red blotch virus. Now, the interesting thing about one of these species, Dictocephala bisonii, is, uh, and, and the common name is buffalo tree hopper. Um, this is also found in some uh, Northern California vineyards uh, and also probably the more common uh, insect found in uh, Southern Oregon vineyards. And so uh, it could potentially be a vector here. Another tree hopper that we've been studying is uh, another Saraceni called Tartistilus. Uh, 
And here you can see all these little tree hoppers, and they're actually bigger than three-cornered alfalfa hopper feeding on, on the vines. Uh, uh, we first saw them in a Pope Valley vineyard and then later in a uh, Gordon, Gordon Valley vineyard. Um, this isn't the, three, uh, the buffalo tree hopper, even though it has horns. But what was interesting is we found both horned and hornless individuals in this population. And we, uh, as we moved forward with this, we tried to determine what species it is. Uh, the horned species were thought to be uh, one called Torticillus albidus barsus. The ones with horned horns um, were one of possibly two different species. But when we, tr when we, what was interesting to us is that we found these all on the same vines, on the same vineyards, and so it didn't seem possible that these were actually different species. Um, so we looked at DNA analysis of these different species, and we found that, in fact, there's no difference in the, se uh, the sequences of any of these morphotypes that we were seeing in the vineyard. So that would indicate that they're one species. And we went on from that to look at the morphology of the genitalia. Genitalia are what systematists look at to try to determine um, which species it is. And when we looked at this, we found that the, the uh, and these are um, auto montage photographs of the, gen of the male genitalia of all of those different morphotypes. There's indistinguishable from one another. So again, that would character, they would mean that they're probably a single species. Then we actually did mating studies of these, and we were able to see in the mating studies that uh, where we crossed uh, males with horns with fem and females uh, without horns, so we had different combinations of those, um, that we were actually able to successfully get offspring from these in, a, in several cases. And this is really difficult work to do, because it, um, this, it turns out that there's one generation a year of these. So we collected them in June of one year, did the matings from the, uh, after that, had to hold the insects for a whole year the, uh, on uh, hose until they emerged. And then finally we're able to determine what the adults looked like uh, from that. And so uh, anyway, the, uh, uh, we uh, uh, did a field study then, a field transmission study in 2019, where we collected them from, they're impossible for us to rear, so we collected them from vets that were nearby a vineyard. We, let, we collected nymphs. We let them emerge to adults. Um, we uh, let some of the adults feed on uh, uh, directly in the field on uh, the infected plants in this particular vineyard. Then we removed them. We put them on uh, uh, recipient plants that were virus-free in the, in the same vineyards uh, for inoculation and we still haven't seen any transmission with them. So are they a vector or not? Um, our initial thought is they're not a vector, but we only did 48-hour uh, acquisition periods and inoculation periods, so that's not 10 days that was shown in that uh, study last year. So we're hoping to go back and repeat this study again and see if that could potentially be a vector. So it's very complicated to be doing the vector research. I'm sure you'll hear a lot about that from other entomologists uh, later today. Um, um, but we're working on it, and hopefully uh, we'll have more to tell a little later. And I just want to acknowledge all the people that have been involved in the studies and the program and some of the funding agencies. Uh, thank you very much.